Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the meeting for August 5th, 2020, regular meeting of the Board of Education. Please note that Anthony and Suzanne are both not present this evening. Lorraine and Don will be um, running a few minutes late. Everyone, please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have two memorial resolutions on the agenda for this evening. Memorial 3.1 is in honor of Miss Leanna Billups, who was employed by the Monroe Woodbury Central School District as a one-on-one -on -one monitor. Her employment with the district began January 2018. And whereas through her dedication to the district, Leanna has touched the lives of many individuals in our district, it is hereby resolved that the Board of Education, on behalf of the entire district, extends in memoriam its appreciation and gratitude, as well as its sincere condolence to the Billups family. As the above resolution is adopted by the board, it will become part of the official historical records of the district and will serve as a memorial lasting for all time. Our second memorial resolution is in honor of Michael Rahm. Whereas Mr. Michael Rahm was employed by the Monroe Woodbury Central School District as the head of grounds, his employment with the district began in 1984. And whereas through his dedication to the district, Michael has touched the lives of many individuals in our district. It is hereby resolved that the Board of Education, on behalf of the entire district, extends in memoriam its appreciation and gratitude as well as its sincere condolence to the Rahm family. As the above resolution is adopted by the board, it will become part of the official historical records of the district and will serve as a memorial lasting for all time. Can I get a motion? Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. A reading of our mission statement. We are committed to academic achievement and success for all students in a safe environment. In partnership with families and our community, our mission is to promote confidence, inspire a passion for learning, and to prepare our students to become responsible global citizens. Approval of the revised agenda. Can I please get a motion to approve the revised agenda? I motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Questions and comments from interested citizens. I'd like to also make note this evening of the social distancing guidelines and ask that at the end of the meeting, everyone will be exiting to my left, which is the exit over here. And for what those that are coming up to speak, if you can please just give your distance and give the first speaker their opportunity. And once they're seated, then the second person can come up and speak. Okay. I think we're also going to clean. Yes, the we'll, and we'll, we'll also clean the podium in between the speakers. I believe we have two in-person speakers this evening, and then we also have two speakers that um, Ms. Vitucci will read as they are not present, but they um, have sent their information to the district clerk. Okay. So our first speaker is Ms. Shelby Seth. on behalf of the Hudson Valley Change Coalition. Good evening, thank you guys for having me today. Sorry, this mask and my earring don't get along. Okay. So as Monroe Woodbury Central School District alumni, the Hudson Valley Change Coalition is incredibly disappointed in the lack of response and urgency from Superintendent Rodriguez, her cabinet, and the entire Board of Education. We met with the superintendent, her cabinet, and Board of Education, Board of Education President, John Huberth, on June 15, 2020, to address the racial bullying environment that has persisted in Monroe Wood Woodbury for decades. We attempted to schedule a follow-up meeting on June 16th, 2020, and received no response. We then followed up with another email requesting for a check-in meeting on July 23rd, 2020, which received no response as well. We then forwarded our lack of response email thread individually to the entire Monroe Woodbury Board of Education, 
And as of t today, August 5th, 2020, we still have not received a single response. <clears throat> we, um, sorry. We also had a group of current Monroe Blueberry High School students reach out to these administrators for a follow-up meeting as well. And their la last email correspondence from Rodriguez was on July 6th, 2020. While we understand the superintendent and board of education have a high priority in devising a plan for reopening schools, we, as both black and brown, current and former Monroe, Monroe Woodbury students, feel as though racial bullying is and has historically been a high priority issue as well that deserves rectification as soon as school commences as well. Other school districts in New York State are able to devise both a strategic plan to address the coronavirus issue as well as the racial bullying issues that have existed within their schools and have been brought to their attention. If you need resources, we are more than happy to, to provide them via email. We are actively working to change the culture that has stifled the growth of black and brown students and Superintendent Rodriguez assured us at our initial meeting that we would have her full attention. <clears throat> The racial injustice that plagues Monroe Woodbury must be a priority for the board, especially now that BIPOC students are facing two pandemics that disproportionately affect them and their families. We are demanding a check-in meeting between the Hudson Valley Change Coalition, the superintendent, and the entire board of education before Monroe Woodbury schools reopen to discuss the initiatives that they have implemented in order to ensure the safety and well-being of their black and brown students. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will remind everyone also that the policy for um, questions and response is typically when you come forward and speak, now we will meet behind the scenes and we will then address the comments and concerns either via email, phone call, and we will also publicize it next month at our meeting, which isn't even actually a month, it's August 19th, mm -hmm. I believe. I think one of the things that we need to have is a phone number, your emails don't have just as an organization and no phone number to contact someone. So if you'd like to email us and give us that information, a name and a number, so that we can have that on record as well. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't see. Are we good to go for the podium? I think he cleaned, okay. he, cleaned. Yes, he did. Okay, so thank you. So Kim Laskorski, on behalf of herself as an RN. Good evening. First, I hope you and your families are all well and stay insane in this new normal world of imperfection and uncertainty. Although I do not have any children anymore in Monroe Woodbury, I still care about all our students and the staff, especially as being an RN for 37 years. I just have a few questions related to the COVID and returning to school. First one, is there a protocol for actual COVID testing before the opening of school? It's good having a survey, but this in no way assures the person does not have COVID. Most positive people have no symptoms. I work in a large government installation and our surveys are negative, but when tested, more than 50 people can be positive COVID. I have no doubts you will keep the staff and students safe while transported to school, in school and returned home. But how will you safeguard about COVID not walking through the school doors? Question two, if a teacher was to teach from her classroom and became ill or had to stay home for her family reasons, can she not then teach from her home but streamline it into the classroom? This way the kids would still be in school for those that chose to go to school and the teaching is not interrupted. Teacher monitors and TAs can be utilized in the classrooms. Number three, Wi-Fi reception is poor at best at some locations. I know you are going to assess the situation over the few weeks of school, but in the end, will this be fully resolved? And if not, what are the realistic options? And finally, not wanting Monroe Woodbury Central School District to become a TV reality show, how do you protect both the staff and students from others taping the remote learning school days from liabilities? I do not envy your position, but do appreciate all that you are doing. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. 
Um, our next agenda item is the presentation of the 2020 Stacey, reopening Stacey, framework. Stacey, hold, one, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I forgot about the two <laughs> virtual ones. Uh, Ms. Petucci will go ahead and read those. I apologize. Um, the first comment is from Rhonda Sicily. She has a question. When students are not in school, will their classes be live so students can ask questions, as if the student were sitting in class? Or will they be recorded so that the student will log on after the class has met? Thank you. And the next comment is from Dana Selkowski. Superintendent Rodriguez, Board of Education member, Board of Education members, excuse me, administration and staff of each of the district buildings and everyone working to support our children during these very complex times. Thank you. We appreciate your thoughtful assessment of a dynamically changing environment and transparent communication with the community. There is truly no easy, much less correct decision, but you are all charged with making one that will affect so many. Your time, energy, and diligence is appreciated more than you know. Thank you, the Selkowski family. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now presentation of the 2020 reopening framework by Mrs. Rodriguez, Superintendent of Schools. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the board and the community who is sitting and, and watching at home. I want to start this presentation by saying that on March 12th, the Board of Education and I made a decision to close schools for March 13th. We never imagined that from that day we would not return to school for that school year. Um, it was a very trying time and for many of our students it was a, uh, an emotional, difficult time for families. Parents became caretakers and school teachers and school teachers were at home teaching along with their children. So it was a very, very difficult time for everyone. Not only for um, a health, a global health pandemic, but also because we had an economic crisis along with social unrest. So this has been an ongoing situation for, for many, many months. And so, um, let's see if I can do this. It's not working. Now they're not going to lower the lights. We're, I'm just going to keep going. Can you shut the lights? I can't. They're all on the same thing. Do we know why this is not? Oh, there it oh, goes. It's going. It just there we go. So here we go. Let's go back. Got it. Thank you. It's a little slow. So in late June, the Board of Education uh, and I and the Cabinet decided that we would create what's called a core task force team. And in late June, that core task force team was four board members and five cabinet members. And we decided that we would begin to create some sort of a framework, because at that time we had not received any guidance from the State Education Department or the Department of Health. We convened as a nine-member team and then decided that we would have a much larger audience. And we had approximately 90 members in the community who were part of this reopening task force. That included teachers and students, administrators, board of members, community members, and of doctors and nurses. And this was the work that we started. We were very fortunate that I had the opportunity to be on the regional reopening task force. And so I modeled our task force uh, along with that, with the regional one. Am I doing it the wrong? There we go. Let me just double check. This is just trying to see here. I apologize, I'm having some technical difficulty. At least, we have, at least we have power. So the reopening task force, can you hear me? The reopening task force had quite a bit of work. And one of the things that they had to do was research, best practices. They had to meet. Um, they had extensive discussions. They looked at reports and findings. And then they eventually uh, had, a, had a presentation to the reopening core team. One of the other things that we did was we um, administered multiple surveys to our families, to our staff, to our teachers, to our students, because we wanted to gather as much data as we could. So I just want to take a moment, it was a, approximately 90 people, to thank everyone who was on that task force, because I know there were many, many hours spent doing all of this work and gathering all of this data. And so what we came about was the three priorities. Our first priority is the safety and well-being of our students, staff, and family. 
Um, our second is a social emotional support for students, staff, and family. And the last is robot, robust instruction, both online and um, in person. And it's in that order. And I know that many educators wonder why that is the order, but we're unable to do anything if our students aren't safe and our teachers aren't safe. The second piece is if there's no social emotional support for our students, then that becomes just so much more difficult. And then the last is when you can teach. So teaching and learning happens when those two first items are met. We surveyed our families and one of the major questions that we had, which we received over 2,500 responses was, which instructional model do you prefer based on the CDC and the New York State education guidelines? 70% of our parents felt that they would, um, they would send their children to school in a hybrid model, and 30% of our families felt that they were very uncomfortable and they did not want to send their children back to school for a multitude of reasons. It could be that there's a family member that's at home that is ill, they have concerns about COVID, um, or their children getting sick. So that was 30% of our families. And so we gathered all of that information and we create what's called the Inspire Reopening Framework. And last Friday, we were required to um, submit that. It's a framework. It is not the entire plan. And I, I'm going to continually say that because the framework is how, we, you know, how are we looking to open up our school, our specific school that houses over 6,700 students. And then we had to post that on our website. So again, it's a framework, it's not the total plan. We will continue to develop the plan as time, as we gather more information from um, the governor's office. So one of the questions that I've received is, so why can't we have a traditional in-person um, instruction? And the main reason is when we received guidance on July 13th, uh, it, they were very clear that what we had to do was to make sure that we, our students were socially distanced, six feet socially distant, along with wearing a mask. The other thing is, is that when we transport children, we had to hold to that model. So right now we have our school buses can transport up to 72 students. With this, with this guidance, we probably can transport about 23, 23 students in a 72 passenger bus. So those two things made it impossible for the school district to say that we could fully reopen. The next model is fully remote that they wanted us to look at, which means that students are at home and teachers are teaching online the entire five days. And then the last model, which is the hybrid model, is what we felt was the best way to address. We know that we want to have our students in the building and it's K to 12. We want, to, we want to make sure that our high school students do have an opportunity to go back into the buildings. So we developed what's called the hybrid model. A fully remote, as I said before, is where students are at home and the hybrid model. I want to go back to the fully remote model. One of the things that I felt and the board and the cabinet and, and, and the entire task force felt is that we wanted to make sure the parents had an option. By allowing parents to have their students learn fully remote at home, we felt that we were going to have them uh, have some, um, a way to support them at home and yet keep them safe. We know that parents who are um, totally against sending their children to school, we want to make that a possibility for them. So providing them with, with a fully remote option is the best way. So parents do have an opportunity to choose that option, and they have until August 12th. The hybrid, which is what we're offering all of our students, offers both traditional and in-classroom learning and synchronous remote learning. And we're going to talk a little bit about synchronous learning. Synchronous learning is live instruction whether it's the teacher is in front of you or whether the teacher is live online. So that's synchronous learning. You're going to hear that word a lot. Another word that you're going to hear a lot is asynchronous learning. Asynchronous learning is when students on their own time decide to do, uh, to, to do the work that's been posted for them. So synchronous is live, asynchronous is at a student's schedule. The greatest difficulty that we had was how do we now bring in students to school 
and again, follow the guidelines that the New York State Department of Education provided us and the Department of Health. I should note that when the two guidelines came out, there was some conflicting information, and so we went to who has more authority. The Department of Health has more authority over the New York State Department of, of Education. So some of the things you may read in one, in one recommendation that we don't have to have um, masks on, but according to the Department of Health, when students are being transported, they should be wearing a mask. They need to wear a mask and they need to keep to six feet social distancing. So we decided to divide our students into what we call our AB groups. And these groups are going to be based on households. And the reason we chose that was because one of the um, surveys that we asked, we asked parents, how would you like students to be uh, grouped? And, and many parents responded that they wanted their children to be grouped together. So I'll give an example. If at the Mr. Kravitz is, is, is one of our families, and he's got four children, his four children will be going to school the same day, two days a week. And we wanted to make sure that that way parents knew that all the students would be going home, going to school together, and they would be home together. Um, so this model, students will attend schools on alternating days, A, B, to minimize the number of people in the building. Again, one of the things that we're required to do is also, you're going to hear this a lot, is balance classrooms. So if a classroom typically has 24 students, we're going to balance it so we have 12 students so that we can maintain six feet of social distancing. And, and another note there is same household attend school on the same day. And groups individually initially will, di will be divided into half to allow for smaller groups uh, in buildings from A1, A2, B1, and B2. And I'll explain that. So the phase in model is we're going to bring in our teachers for three weeks. We're going to train them on the protocols. We're going to work out, I think Mrs. Laskorski said, how are you going to work out the kinks about remote teaching? We're going to work out those kinks. We're going to find out um, what student isn't logging on. We're going to connect with those students. And so those three weeks, because the first week is teachers only and then the second two weeks is, is, um, is remote, those next two weeks are critical for us because we want to make sure that our teachers are also comfortable as far as the new way of entering a building. Um, the protocols that we're going to ask teachers to have, for example, those of you who are in, in here know that you had to take an online questionnaire, right? So that is a protocol that we're required to have by the Department of Health. And so those are the things that we wanted to make sure. And we felt that if we even took half of the students and broke them into smaller groups, we can then begin to um, help our students understand the new protocols and the new way that school is going to function. So school starts September 1st. And our calendar originally says that school would start for our students on the 3rd. We are going to change our calendars and we're doing what's called front loaning all of our superintendent conference days. We felt that was critical because we wanted our teachers to come in, have professional development, have um, test the connectivity, and go over safety and health protocols. Not only that, but later on you'll hear about an organization that we're partnering up to talk about being culturally responsive and also being a traumatic, uh, traumatic informed classroom. So all instructional buildings will be open and the teachers will be in the buildings five days a week. For the first two weeks from August 8th to August, I'm sorry, from September 8th to September 18th, we will have two weeks of fully remote learning, meaning students will be at home, they will be live with their teachers and we will see how everything works. That gives us two full weeks. And at the bottom, as you can see, Mondays are always going to be what we call synchronous remote learning days, live instruction. Every Monday, students will log on and they will see their teacher and they will um, go through their classes. This is a typical calendar, so this is September. If you see September 1st, we have September 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. You have the teachers will be returning to school. Those four days are really blocked for them to have professional development, go over protocols, ask any questions that they have, take a look at their classrooms, make sure that what we're doing in preparation for when our students return is correct. And then that Monday is a holiday, started with remote instruction for two weeks. You can see that goes all the way out to, August, to September 18th. 
Then that following Monday, we have that remote learning. Mondays is always remote learning for our students. And we start with this very small group called A1. So if you're in the A group, you're going to be divided into A1 and A2. So on Tuesday, the A1 group will come in, B1, A2, and B2. And then we're going to do the exact same thing the following weeks. Everything is going to happen in two weeks increments. Beginning October 6th, we're then going to bring in all the students. So all the students will be riding the bus, all the students in Group A will be riding the bus, and all the students in Group B will be riding the bus. So when Group A students are attending school, are physically in the building, Group B will be uh, um, having synchronous learning. Meaning that, and this will happen till at the end of the month, but our goal is to have our classroom teachers live stream their lesson, and so students will have the option of either going in live and listening to the lesson or going on um, Google Classroom and seeing the lesson that has been downloaded for them. This again is going to take some time. So for the beginning of that, you'll see that students who are at home will be doing asynchronous work, meaning that they'll just be getting their work from their teacher and they'll be working on their classes. And then the hybrid schedule is going to continue until um, we're able to resolve this. And that's what the schedule would look like. So you have A, B, A, B, A, B. And I know there's been a lot of question as to why did we choose this model. And I will tell you that this came directly from the task force, the teaching and learning. Some of the options were, well, why don't we have the students go to school for a full week? The teachers and the committee felt that it's a long time for students to be away from the classroom for an entire week. Much happens during that. And we also know that during this pandemic, it's been very difficult for our students. So I, I like to use the term keeping eyes on our students. So it's very difficult if students are in one week, out the next week, to be able to have continuity. And, and instructional, instructionally, it doesn't function as well. So that's why we went with the AB. Another question that was asked was, why did we do AABB? Uh, again, that came back from the committee that they felt that this was, was better to, in order to instruct students and to have some more continuity. Um, a question that I was asked, why did we pick Monday as our remote learning day? When you look at the calendar, there are seven days in, uh, in the school calendar that are holidays on Monday. So I didn't want to have any particular group be hit with holidays and having less instruction. What we value about this is the time that our students are in the classroom with their teachers. I can't hear, sorry. This is, this is all, they're telling me that I have to lean in. Or pull the mic closer, maybe a little. Yeah, long. maybe that's it. I think we can all hear you. I think the, the YouTube is I having think, a little difficult. Right. Oh, they are? The live audio. That's the first I've ever heard. I usually have a loud mouth. It's my teacher voice that I, that I use. So again, this is what the schedule will look like because um, we need to make sure that students are in classroom and we need to make sure that when students are online they have robust instruction and when students are at home, I'm sorry, in school, they have robust instruction. So if you see that was one of our priorities. What's next? Um, well, the governor is going to make the final decision. So I think one of the things that I've, I've been hearing from the community is, Mrs. Rodriguez, why don't you have a full plan rolled out already? And my response to that is that uh, Governor Cuomo has said that he will make the ultimate decision as to what we'll be doing come September. And so it's, um, for us, it doesn't make sense to, to delve into creating a strict uh, plan knowing that the governor may change. And what I mean by that is the governor has the right to come back and say, for the first two months, you will be fully remote. The governor may say, I don't want anyone to do any remote work. You must begin on a hybrid model immediately. All of those things are possibility that our governor may choose to do. And of course, he's making his decision on health protocols, the ability for school districts to purchase all of these PPEs. Uh, I will tell you that Monroe Woodbury has spent like over a million dollars. Yeah. I'm looking at Patrick because I... I, I That's accurate. Between yeah. purchases that we made at the end of last year, technology purchases, PPE, 
it's expensive. It's very expensive, and we're very fortunate that we are in good financial standings and that we can do that. Um, we, we've had to purchase screening for students, masks for teachers and students. There's many, many things that in order to open, we must do. And again, I, I want to highlight the fact that we are going to be running passenger buses that can hold 72 students and only have approximately 24 students in, in riding in them. So there's a lot of hardship that's going on, and I don't know, every school was required to develop their own plan. Um, they're not reading. And so I just want to be sh sure that everyone understands that. They won't be approving our plan. He is just going to see what, what, um, what he's receiving back from, from school districts and his constituents, and he will make that decision. So at the end of the week, our goal is to, for him to make his decision by Friday. That will then um, propel us to begin to finalize all of our plans. I think that by developing a plan that has remote, hybrid, it gives us the flexibility. If I have to change anything on that schedule, I'm able to do that. Um, the plan will adjust accordingly and finalize the instructional day for remote and in-person fully. More information, our goal is to provide more information to our families by Tuesday, August 11th, and then uh, uh, continue to have ongoing communication with our families. We've, we have a dedicated page. Do you want to say something? No, I just, I was waiting for you to <laughs> reference that because I know that um, the community has been sending in questions via the Google form that's online. Mm -hmm. And while we're, you're answering some of those questions with the presentation, I think some of the concern was how will the remainder of those questions be answered in time for them to make their decision by August 12th. Right, and that's why I have yeah. Tuesday up there. I think what you're going to hear from us is that on, um, are you giving me another mic? Thank you. Sorry. Now I'm going to have three no. mics. <laughs> Hello? Okay, take that one. Hello? So what I didn't say when I started this was that this is going to be an imperfect year. And this is an example of it. For example, we were at the Ed Center today thinking that everything was fine because we had power. And then at approximately 2 o'clock, the power went. So what I didn't talk about when I started to talk about our plan is that we need to be flexible. And we need to know that we're all going to do the best that we can, given the situation that we're put in. Just like right now, I've had three microphones put in front of me, and I finally have one that works. But flexibility is going to be the key. So what we were saying was, um, on Tuesday, we'll have more information for our families. What we're going to do at the end of this is we're going to have six frequently asked questions that we can answer, because we feel like we want to start to give our families more and more information. The other piece that was um, very interesting was that our task force, we had a social emotional task force. And, and of course, we have to remember that our students were not only in a, in a pandemic, they were, parents were suffering from an economic downturn. And on, on, to, to add to that was our social unrest. So there, were, there was a lot flooring around with our students and our families, and yet we weren't able to connect with them. So one of the main focuses, and I said it's my second priority, is how am I going to make sure that our families uh, have social emotional uh, support and we are culturally responsive? So. Uh, Ms. Taubert and um, Ms. Ricker both have reviewed multiple organizations that we could partner up because we feel that this is a priority for the district. And what we found, or what they found, was an organization called Eye Opening Enterprises. And what they can do is that they focus on trauma infor informed and culturally responsive program. And they have a combination of evidence informed professional development to make schools successful. What I liked about this organization and the reason when, they, when we met with them yesterday, I liked the fact that they talked about change and systemic change. And systemic change doesn't happen overnight. 
And when you're going to be making systemic change, you really have to have an opportunity to look at what where the issues are. And so one of the things I've talked about with some of the board members is I believe that the school district first and foremost should look at where we are. What are where are we not rising to the to the level that we should be? So I call it I call it something called an equity audit. They called it a gap analysis. So this company is um, willing to come in, create an equity audit, look at our um, rate of suspension. Are our students of color suspend, being suspended more than white students? Look at our classes of our advanced placement classes. Are there some inequities in those classes? And again, what I, what I felt was really important is that if we're going to make systemic change that last beyond everybody sitting on this stage, then we have to do this right. And we have to do it so that the students, the future students, the future Monroe Woodbury students aren't getting up and saying what Shelby had to say. In fact, they're going to get up and say, you know what, I appreciate the fact that the school district made a commitment. And so I'm going to just say I apologize for not responding, but I want you to know that it wasn't that it wasn't in the forefront of our work. It's that sometimes you have to focus on the, what's the here and now, and for us, it was reopening our schools and coming up with all of these things. So again, the eye-opening enterprise is a, is a is an organization that I think is right from Monroe Woodbury. Because what they're going to do is they're going to come in and provide professional development for our teachers. They're going to train uh, key people in every school building. And they're going to talk about the things that we need to change. And they're going to, they're going to be evidence-based. And I think this board is very big on show me the evidence. So we're investing in this company. How are we going to prove that this company is really making a change for the district? They're going to provide speakers. They're going to do online um, presentations. So they are a very multifaceted organization that I think that we are going to be partnering up. And that's something that we're going to talk a little bit further. But I just wanted to bring it up um, at this presentation. And I also want to thank um, Dawn and Christine because they've invested a lot of time in, in um, looking for an organization that will work well with us. So here are some frequently asked questions. I get to ask the questions and the cabinet gets to answer it. First question is, how are students being grouped into A, B? So I'll, I'll take that one. Um, basically, we have 6,500 kids in our school district. Can you hear, can you hear me? Uh, we have 6,500 uh, kids in our school district. And when we determined that they were going to be split by household, that basically cut our kids in the number of those kids in half. So the first 3,250 became the A students and the other 3250 became the B students. So Mrs. Rodriguez referred to A1, A2, B, B1, B2, and A, A and B. That's how we arrived at the initial number. What we then you know, did working with the, the building principals is they need, needed to then balance classes and that's what they've continued to work on. We'll have more information about that once we receive all of our requests for um, solely online instruction. And then once we know those number of students to take out of the mix, we'll be able to continue to, to balance our classes. But that's, that's how we did that. So the, the next question is, what will remote, remote learning look like for our students? And will, be the, will the teachers be providing live instruction? M Mrs. Rodriguez alluded to this earlier. And for those of you, I know that there was some sound issues. So I'll, I'll kind of go through the scenarios again. Uh, remote only learning consists of uh, both regular live synchronous instruction, and I'll talk about what synchronous means in a second, along with asynchronous opportunities for the students. The, the most common example of live synchronous remote instruction is when a class of students logs into Google Meet and they have a virtual lesson run by their teacher. The students don't need to be in the same physical location and in most instances they're not going to be in the same physical location. They can be wherever, um, you know, wherever they might be at that particular time. Uh, the, the teacher could be teaching the students from their his or her classroom. Uh, they could have, in, in the hybrid model, it could be with a group of students in front of them and the classroom is being streamed live remotely to uh, another group of students. The teacher could also be uh, streaming live in Google Meet from their homes to a group of students. The, the reason why we, we made an emphasis about distributing devices to students uh, 
this school year is to try to maximize the students' access to regular synchronized remote learning, whether it's in the hybrid model on the alternate days that kids are not in school or on the remote only days or for the remote, the fully remote only options is to make sure that we give our students as many synchronous live opportunities as, as we possibly can. Asynchronous learning are flexible opportunities where students have the ability to be engaged in learning not necessarily all at the same time and and to use the example that Mrs. Rodriguez gave a, a teacher may record a lesson it could be a recording of a lesson that they delivered to a group of in-person students or it could be a lesson that they're recording themselves using a variety of different materials or a lab maybe in a science classroom and they post that, that lesson or that video in Google Classroom and the students are given a window of time to view that lesson and then to do work and, and, and complete an assignment maybe related to that. Um, related to the, the remote learning experience, we received a lot of questions about what will that Monday remote only day look like. And, and it will be synchronous opportunities for our students to connect live with their teachers. Each Monday will be will be synchronous. Um, next question. Wait, yep, I got Monday. Is that so? The, the next question is: Once parents make a choice regarding the type of instruction, if if they opt for for a fully remote the fully remote option, or if they choose to just keep their kids in school in the hybrid model. Can they change their minds mid-semester or mid-trimester? And the, the letter that Mrs. Rodriguez initially sent out said that that option is going to be for elementary students f through the first trimester. Uh, for secondary students, it'll be through the first semester. As of right now, we don't know if, if it's gonna be possible for us to be able to switch kids. The reason why we, it was important for us to offer this option to families based upon the survey results that we received, However, the reason why we're asking parents to commit to a semester or a trimester is because we need to make sure that we, we have balanced class sizes, whether the, it's the students that are in the hybrid model in person or whether it's the students that are going to be fully remote. Um, this allows us to make sure that we, we can maintain the, the Department of Health social distancing guidelines for the kids that are physically present. Right now, every single student in the school district is scheduled as if they were going to be attending school in person. Next week is the deadline for parents to notify us of whether they would like to have their child educated remotely or not. And after that deadline passes, we then need to redistribute kids and the kids who are gonna be remote only are gonna be placed in a remote only setting. And the kids that are going to be hybrid are going to be, um, the, the classes are gonna be rebalanced with the kids who are gonna be scheduled to be in school, physically in person in the hybrid model. The challenge about allowing people to, to shift in the middle of the trimester and the semester is all of those classes following that deadline have to be balance, rebalance once again. And if we allow shifts in the middle, it will cause a, a, a shift possibly in the balancing of classes resulting in higher class sizes in one model and lower class sizes in another model. So right now, uh, until we really go through that process, we're not going to know if, if it's even gonna be a possibility for us to um, allow people to, to shift. Dr. Hasser, yep. just a quick clarification. Are you saying that if they start off in the hybrid model that they cannot choose to go remote? They're committed for the semester that way as well, both ways? We're not sure because all, all, of, these, all of these situations still in the end, we have to have um, balanced class sizes within our, you know, within the school district from just from a teacher's perspective to be able to manage the classes and, and grade the, the students in the classroom. Um, you know, Typically our class sizes are plus or minus 25 or so kids you know, in, in that range. We, we can't have the, the remote only classes going up to 30, 40, 50 kids because in the end, the teacher is still responsible for teaching those students, grading their work and doing all of the preparation that goes behind it. So still all of the classes need to be as balanced as we possibly can make them, whether they're remote or in person. Does that, does that make sense the way that I'm explaining it? Yes. Donna's mic is not working. All right, I'm just Eric. My teacher voice. Okay. Um, Eric. I think one of the things that is very Eric. Is important to Eric. know is that Eric. we know that the reason Eric. that we're doing it won't pick up on YouTube.
So if a family, it's okay. I don't. I don't need it. I don't need it. The, they, it, won't the people, on, it won't pick up people online. Who are, who, are, who are listening online? Can't yeah. Know. Sorry. So so if a family, and this is how, this is how, I want you to understand my thinking. So if a family begins hybrid, and unfortunately that family becomes sick someone in the household has cancer or has to have uh, chemotherapy, we're gonna do everything in our power to take care of that. Uh, what, what is gonna be difficult is when a parent who goes remote and then says, I wanna be in a classroom, because that, that becomes a difficult task for us because remember that we're always doing a balancing act. We're making sure that the classes fit the room and not only fit the room, but that we can transport the children. And this is where it becomes super complicated. I will tell you that most districts our size have gone fully remote for their high school students. They made that decision because it is, it is very, very difficult to do what we wanna do. But I will tell you that when I met with our high school students, one of the things that they asked me, because we had a task force of students, they said, please bring us in. Even if it's one day, we wanna be in the building like everyone else. And so that was a commitment that we made to all of our students that we would bring in our high school students. I think that we need to make sure, I remember the phrase I use, I like to put eyes on the children. I think it's important for us to put eyes on our children, even if it's two days a week. So again, there's going to be extenuating circumstances. We are not a rigid district that says absolutely not, but we want people to, to make a decision and make an informed decision, but be committed to it, knowing that there are going to be circumstances where families may need to come to us and say, look, I just, it's, it's not safe for my child to come into school. Sorry. But it would be easier, I mean, logically, it's easier for us to go from a hybrid child to go say, I want to go remote now, because now you're just lightening the class load. The teacher's responsibilities are still the same. If they have 30 kids, 15 in, 15 out, it's the same amount of responsibilities. Yes, we don't want to start the premise of like, they're gonna start two weeks and then everyone's gonna start going remote. But if a right. circumstance arises where a child needs to stay home, that's the easier way. I think parents need to know going the opposite way. Correct. If you are a remote, and now you want to go hybrid because you can't get someone to stay in at your house or you have to go to work. That may not happen until the next semester when we can make an actual change because now you might have to juggle a classroom around because there's too many child. But the re going from hybrid to remote should be a little easier for our district. The uh, Bringing a remote child back into hybrid is going to be very difficult and that should be, a, 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 for my opinion, is parents should make that decision wisely when they make it to say I'm going to try the remote and if it if it's not going to work after two weeks remotely at home they can't just call up and say hey I want my kid to come back and do hybrid now uh, but the other way I think would be a little easier but I understand what you're saying as far as class size but and then and I'd like to offer a clarification though on a point that you made that the the movement interchangeably between the hybrid and the remote model does not mean that the student is going to remain in that particular classroom. Meaning, if if we have a certain number of third grade parents that request to have their child educated remotely, right now all third graders are distributed into classroom teachers. What is going to happen is we are going to have remote section, remote only sections of third grade and we're going to have hybrid model of hi the hybrid classes of third grade. Students who are going to be remote only are going to have exclusively live synchronous opportunities with their teacher full time. It's not I'm a hybrid, I'm, I'm a teacher of a hybrid class. I now have a student that's going to go remote. That student then would then have to go into a remote only teacher and change in the classroom teacher. It's not the same. But not the same for secondary? Secondary is, is a little bit of a different situation, only because um, th the way that remote sections may be, you may have a teacher who teaches five sections. Some of their sections may be remote. Some of their sections may be hybrid. Okay, so, so to simplify this, you're a third grade teacher and Matt's the third grade teacher. Right. You're teaching only remote kids. Correct. He's teaching the hybrid kids. Correct. So a kid cannot go from hybrid, hybrid 
Because if that kid wants to go remote, he now becomes a student in your class. Correct. Correct. Okay, so that's correct. A little because the way that the way that the way that Mr. Kravitz is designing his instruction, he knows that he's going to be seeing his kids right. alternating right. every right. other day, right. and and the work well, that, that he's that, assigning those kids is different than the way that the remote only teacher is going to be designing we, their work. We were all under the impression right. yes. that uh, you, uh, you were doing both. Secondary, you said it's a little bit different. Can you sure. Well, and, and that's and that's part of the reason why you know as administrators we're we're very precise in our in our language. That's when I said we don't know what the possibilities are going to be until we go through the entire process to see what the requests are in terms of people wanting remote remote only. So at the secondary level, the model is going to be a little bit different because, again, students are going to have to be. Um, removed from the in-person classes and we're going to be creating remote only classes. However, there are some classes where that might be easy with algebra where we have 20 sections of algebra and we can create X number of sections of remote only versions of algebra and an algebra teacher may have three sections of in-person algebra and you know hybrid algebra and two sections of remote algebra. But there are some classes that we offer that only have one or two sections where it may have to be similar to what you're talking about, the kids, the kids who are remote only are only going to be able to log in live to that specific classroom rather than having the live instruction be directly from the classroom teacher. Yeah. Does that make sense the way that I'm explaining it? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, my, cl my class would have been awesome. Though. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I agree, I agree. <laughs> um, so the next question is, are there considerations for special education and English as a new language students? Yes. So the, the plan that we, that, that we released last week, the, the framework that we re released last week, was the general plan and framework for all students, the alternating day hybrid and the fully remote model. However, we are currently reviewing every single one of our special education programs from a class size perspective, from a physical size of the classroom perspective, from a scheduling perspective, as well as all of the different leveled services that our English as a new language students um, receive, the number of minutes that they're required by state mandate, in order to be able to try to provide additional days beyond the two days worth of um, in-person instruction for them. Some of the decisions are contingent upon what the governor says. Some of them are contingent upon the options that people are choosing with regards to remote only. We are going program by program right now and looking at the schedules in order to be able to do everything we possibly can to increase the amount of in-person time that kids are receiving. We anticipate very, very soon to be coming out with that information and what that schedule is going to be looking like. Thank you. So I'd like to raise a couple of questions. Yes. I was waiting for this. Good. All right, so Lorraine, talk louder into the microphone, please. So I'm sorry. Hello. No, because I want people. Can you hear me? To hear it. I okay. Know. Okay. Sorry. So you mentioned there's about 6,500 students. So I think there's about a fifth of those students are with special needs and who need mm -hmm. support. Would mm -hmm. that be a, an approximate, roughly correct number? Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I know that everyone was sent the um, questionnaire on whether they wanted hybrid or remote, mm -hmm. and. Um, I don't think any parent with this child with special need would want remote because clearly there's many things that need to be modified and that's very difficult for a parent to do or even a gen ed teacher. So you need special ed for that. So I have a few questions. Um, can, can I just jump into that statement? So we did get some parents of special ed students that have requested remote. It depends because you have... right. Different but, disabilities, you have different supports that are needed, right. so I'm sure there were, but I would assume, and I'll only assume that the majority would want in-person instruction because they probably have services that they need, OT, PT, mm -hmm. speech, ABA, whatever it be, they need to receive that as well. So um, since we did end school in March, have we tracked and or identified the students who have already regressed? That's one question, in special ed or in gen ed. Mm -hmm. And what are we doing? Um, so can I answer, I mean, sure. to I my, was gonna, okay. you, you, no, you, no, 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 you can, I, I was going to, I wasn't sure if I she I think was one of the things that are happening at the CSEs, right, there's discussion about students' progress. If a student needed additional support or additional um, uh, ABA or whatever it, whatever it is that they need, then the CSE recommends it and that student gets that. It, it, it's a requirement. 
Correct. Yeah, yeah yes, it, it, it's, absolutely. It, it's a requirement yes. where we, we have to, the CSCs to have to meet and they have to provide compensatory services of any identified regression. So we know that it usually is an eight week, you know, regression and right. we have been out since March. So clearly plenty of students have regressed. I'd hope they didn't, but I would think that they did because it's very difficult for a student with special needs to learn remote, mm -hmm. especially a child that's coming in from pre-K, coming into kindergarten. They are just learning. So there are other schools that are having the five-day instruction for children with special needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does this look like we're going in that direction? And if not, if not, because I know the size of our school is large, but you brought up a classroom of 12, mm -hmm. And so you have a 12 one one that may only have eight kids in it. Yep, correct. You may have a 15 one one that only has 10 kids in it. And so that population is much smaller and can achieve that social distancing. You are 100% correct. Okay. So in the event that you have a student with an IEP that um, needs certain services and we're not able to accommodate them, what are we, and legally, what are we supposed to do? Uh, if a parent decides, wants to go to another school that can accommodate them, are we willing and are we able and are we m mandated to do that? So we're mandated to provide this, to, to follow a student's IEP. So if it's in their IEP, the CSC convenes. Um, if I hear your question correctly, what you're saying is, if Warwick is offering five days mm -hmm. and Monroe Woodbury is offering four days, do they get the option to go to Warwick? And my initial response is no. And the reason I say no is because... Well, four days is, is I would think if it was two days. Okay, okay. Four days is... Right, but, but what, is, uh, what we're you know, doing is we're looking at the individual student and we're looking at the programs that they're in, right? So our goal is to, as by the required by the regs, we're supposed to look at our special education students and our ELL students and provide them with additional support. Okay. So that would have to mean that we wouldn't be fulfilling that student's IEP, um, and then again the CSE would make that decision. But a parent um, cannot arbitrarily say, I like the program that Warwick is offering, so I'm sending my child to Warwick. That usually, that is not something that they'll have the option to do. I would talk about more like at a district, like, I, you know, a different a private sector. On, on. And if you're going to get to the four days, clearly that fifth day can be left for services on some students and are we going to provide those students or with the services or are we going to have them go outside to a private sector and have it done on their time to take their student? Right. Probably we would use our district employees to, to provide the services, right? Um, and I would think that our goal is to have all of our students, remember I talked about synchronous Mondays, Synchronous Mondays is for all of our students, and the reason we do that is because, I want to say this again, the governor could come out and say, everyone is synchronous for a month, for two months. And so we have to make sure that everybody um, has that kind of lesson and that we refine online teaching. Because there's going to be times when the school district will be closed, possibly because we have a COVID outbreak, and so we have to be prepared to teach our children remotely. Um, <clears throat> we know that the best instruction for special ed students, EN, ENL students, is and general in. ed student is in here, is in, in when they're in the, you know, the brick and mortar teaching. But we also know that because of COVID, we have to be flexible and responsible and be able to pivot from one program to the next, and so, we want to help our students, all of our students, get the, gain the best success from, from remote online teaching. And I will tell you that you know the students who did take summer school, we have extended school year, was all online. We've had a lot of positive feedback from the parents. The students, it's again, it's, it's synchronous, it's live, and the students have been doing quite well. Um, and maybe at the end of the summer, we can have Nate Peterson, who's the, the principal, get up and speak about it. So again, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that that remote Monday is going to be critical for us, even when we move into the hybrid, because we have to refine that teaching online, because we, we more than likely will have to go to online teaching for periods of time. Can I just ask a question? Yes. Just in, in Lorraine's question. Why is it, is it possible that you have your remote Monday 
and have special ed students come in four days in a row. I mean, if you have an eight and a 12 and a 15 one one mm -hmm. class, mm -hmm. which we just established that you could have probably around 12 students in a class, then why not just determine that those are all C students and they come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and they have their lotted place and they come in four days a week. I, I, we I don't know. If, if there's really only 12 kids in a class anyway, and there's a special ed teacher who only teaches those students anyway, then I don't understand that, why they couldn't come in four days. Why would they be split with the rest of the gen ed and well, not because, receive the because services? Well, because the difference is, you're correct, we have some programs that are, that are for like an 811 or a 1211, but then we have special ed students that are in what's called co-teach. So now they're in regular ed classes, right, with supports. Mm -hmm. Those are, so when we talk about special education students, we talk about an array of students. I know, so, I'm, just, I'm talking more about. Correct. We're talking about more like, like the 12 one There's got to be a level here. The, 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 the fragile we, ones with the most support think, that need, because I'm they just, are going to clearly there's a level here here regress. Of special ed. And, and we I'm really just, need to not let that happen. And so because I that's just, not going to be a good thing. I, I feel as though you've, you, you, we are going to do that. We're, we're again, we're, we're looking at our numbers to make sure we balance. The other piece that I want to make you aware of is that we also have to transport students. Remember that that's, those are the two pieces that forced us to say we can't have traditional school. Mm -hmm. Transporting students, we're going to have a 72 passenger bus with 24 students in a bus and classrooms, classroom size. So all of the things that you guys have mentioned, we are looking into it, right? We're looking to move certain classes into larger classes so we can have more students. But that piece is not enough. We have to be able to transport the children as well. So there's a lot of moving parts. I hope that your takeaway isn't that we're not going to do that. We are certainly, we are required to do that. We're required to provide them with additional support. We just don't know exactly what that's going to look like. And, and some of the considerations are not isolated to the number of kids. It's also the number of adults that are in the room as well. Correct. And, and so yes. we, we, mm -hmm. we, we, we're truly going program by program, class by class of the size of the room, the number of kids, the number of adults, some of the adjustments are going to be made through scheduling. You know, how can we stagger the number of kids in that room where not everybody is in that room simultaneously, that they're, they're tiering the, the related services that kids are being provided and who receives ABA when. So we are truly drilling down to all of those individual scenarios to absolutely make that happen to the best of our ability, 100%. And so the last question is the students that we already have that are out of district, mm -hmm. they will already be transported and those services are? So if the program that they attend is five days a week, then we will transport them five days a week. Mm -hmm. So whatever, whatever program they're attending that's out of district, whatever their schedule is, we will be sending them to their programs. Okay. Dr. Hassel. I think that's all I have for now. <laughs> I'm sure I'll have others. Tech at BOCES? I, I can try. Okay. Can you? <laughs> See what I the mean, plan is for that? sure. Right now, right, right now, BOCES is presenting their plan, their opening plan for CTEC, and our plan is to bust the kids. And yes. So the only problem that we have, and this is this is why this has become a little bit more difficult for school districts in Orange County, is that Orange County did not all sit down and say this is how we're going to run our schedules. So BOCES plans on running an ABC day, which is difficult for us because we're running an A-B day and, and multiple schools are running A-B days. And so their question to us is, our CTEC students, are we committed to providing our CTEC students CTEC? And our response is yes. The goal of this plan is to make sure that we make things as normal as possible. Will that have to be ironed out? Yes, because then we have to, once a student goes to CTEC, whether it's in the morning or the afternoon, we have to create their schedules. And, and so our goal is to work with BOCES to be able to iron out all those pieces. So would they go three days a week to the BOCES? Even though we're only a two it's, it's possible, but an A-B schedule could also be different. So you may go three days one week, one week that's, right. or two days, two days the next week. That's one of the reasons why we chose not to go with that, because it's very fluid. Mm -hmm. So you some kids will go to school two days a week one week and some days they'll go to school three days a week and that becomes 
difficult, difficult for, for difficult parents to manage. manage from a child And then perspective. the other piece is you throw in a holiday. So if you throw in a holiday, now that day has been extended. So what would have been an A day is no day. So we looked at trying to make it as simple as possible. But you should know that this cabinet and this administrative team that is sitting in front of you is dedicated to making sure that we give our kids um, the best experience, experience in a bad situation. Because none of these situations are anything that we would choose, right? We would choose our kids coming to school every day. and so. Things like CTEX, things like going to a BOCES program, all of the things that our kids could have, we will work to make that happen. Uh, it's just challenging. So BOCES is on the same program? BOCES is because ABC. If if they, excuse me? BOCES is on, a, on an no, ABC. No, no, I mean CTEC. Yeah, they're, they're running out of BOCES. And, and they're so doing the same thing? They're doing ABC. ABC. They are, okay. Mm -hmm. They are, okay. So, sorry. How would, I mean, I'm really getting ahead of myself, how you would are. a student, <laughs> you're, you're digging deep. Go ahead. How would a student who is going for a certificate, um, be it whatever, esthetician, mm -hmm. how are they going to be able to accomplish that in four hours a week as opposed to the 20 hours a week that they were receiving? Well, they would probably have to amend the program, mm -hmm. right? Shorten the hours and make sure that students could attain that certificate. And, and the, st the state has already started to come out with language about guidelines where there, there was a required, for example, many of the programs have in, like an internship component, like service hours that the kids have to do. Um, they, they've, they've loosened the language with regards to those expectations where some of the experiences that kids can do may, may not have to be in person, it can be virtual. So they may be able to log in online and and you know work with a, a, a beauty parlor you know that, to use the example that you gave rather than physically having to go there to log all of those hours in person they may be able to do certain things online they may be able to watch videos and things like that in order to fulfill to fulfill that requirement because they weren't able to do that just this June right there are students that did not walk away with because they needed to be in hands on with some right. other like for early childhood development right. you needed to a certain number of hours you had to Correct. have those hours and you had to do your clinical or right. whatever you want to call it or your test with a child right. so that so the the, the guidance you know they didn't have that the, the guidance that Mrs. Rodriguez mentioned earlier the ones that came out on July 13th the, the CTE language is included in that document that talks about all of the, um, the shifts that they're making in okay. terms of loosening the language for that. Yep. I, I'm just still surprised that Dr. Hausler said beauty parlor. I know. I haven't I'm, heard I'm that just, word I'm, in I'm, ages. I, I don't know. Wait, I, 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 they working on a quaff? I, I could have said the barber shop. I, 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 don't, I don't know. The hair salon? The, the hair, hair salon. salon. You said I, beauty I like parlor. Beauty Listen, parlor. I like that. The barber shop. I, 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 um, <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions for Dr. Hassler? And then we have, I think we have... Cleaning, I think. Cleaning. Yep. How so, will buildings and buses be cleaned? Right. Um, so I'll take buses, and then um, Patrick will take buildings. So, so basically, I just want to explain quickly how <coughs> busing will work. So a, a bus will pull up, you know, Miss Irene will be driving, or, or Miss Kimmy, or somebody will be driving the bus. A student will get on the bus if they're if they're wearing their mask. If they don't have a mask, one will be given to them as, as soon as they get on the bus. Once a child gets on the bus, he or she will be seated back to front. So that child, first person on the bus, will walk all the way to the back and take an assigned seat um, until our buses, until we picked up everyone we need to pick up on that particular day. In between, we have three tiers. We have the high school tier, and then we have the middle tier, which is middle school and our kindergarten um, groups. And then we've got our two five tier. In between tiers, the drivers will clean the high touch areas, the handrails, the tops of the seats. And then in between the AM run and the PM run, the bus will be disinfected. The afternoon runs will start, the afternoon tiers. Again, kids will get on when they get in from school, they go back to front. They will, um, in between those tiers, again, those high touch areas will be, will be cleaned. And then once the bus is back at the, the garage for the night, then it will again get fully disinfected. So that's the cleaning uh, of the buses. Okay. Thank you. And I just have a question about the buses. I know we had discussed at one point too, similar to the 
um, August 12th deadline that one of the big questions on the survey was if you were an eligible parent and or custodial parent that you could potentially drive your child to school as opposed to taking the bus, it would then as well, similar to the classroom perspective, open up that seat on the bus. Do we have any type of um, language that we're going to be doing that you want families to make that decision as well? Yes, we are, we are going to provide a deadline for that as well. If you as a parent um, are certain that you're going to transport, of course school districts are required to transport children. You didn't ask that question? That wasn't a question on the It was, it was a, a, a questionnaire. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I'm just saying that I think moving, you know, in the next couple of weeks we're going to ask parents to make that determination. Do you want to drive your child to school or are you going to allow them to take the bus? Because that's information that we're going to need as well. Mm -hmm. Remember, we're doing a balancing act. So it may work out that, you know, 30% of our parents are also going to be driving their children and so that would reduce the, the load on the bus which then would allow me to send um, a group of students to go to school multiple days rather than just two right so these are all the pieces so yes there is going to be something that's going to go out to parents saying if you as a parent are deciding to um, drive your child to school you need to let us know but again that's fluid because school districts have a responsibility to transport children. I cannot tell a parent who said to me, I, I plan on driving, but it's, you know, in a month from now, well, I, I can't drive my child anymore. I have to provide that. That's mm -hmm. a legal responsibility for school districts. So that's a little bit more um, difficult, but yes, we're going to ask that question. But as, as an option for those Correct. that can. But again, being fluid that if car breaks down or something happens and now the child has to get bused, they will be provided busing. With right. enough information, right, you need, you need to give us 24 hours. Right. So I think those are the pieces that we need to know. And, and again, the problem with that is, is that we, once someone says, I'm not going to have my child on the bus, then I put another seat. If I only have 24 passengers, I've got to now put another child on there. So I may go over that number. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and again, I, I just want to say those are the really difficult things for us. It's not so much the instruction piece, it's the management of a class size, it's the management of keeping kids socially distanced and transporting children safely to school. Uh, are we going to have something, I, I know this is bad to say, but mommy says to little Johnny, just go get on the bus because the bus pulls up in front of her house and picks up two other kids usually and kid runs out to get on the bus. How is the bus driver going to be like, uh, we, we well, I just wanted that to be out there that you can't do that, but so it here will is, happen. And, and that's going to happen, yeah, right? I I, I, that, those are the challenges that, that we worry about is something. that a parent puts a child at the bus stop when they're a B kid and they're supposed to be at the bus stop when, on the A day. We, we have to make allowances for that. Um, one thing that we won't do is that we won't leave a child at the bus stop by themselves. So that may mean that the bus driver may have to radio someone in and say, look, I've, I've got a maximum number of kids. Somebody's going to need to pick up that child or multiple things that have to happen. And so those are the things that, that obviously keep me up at night, you know, making sure that our children are picked up and that they're safe. Um, but yes, th those are, if a student shows up and mom says them and mom is gone, then that child is ours. You know, we, we have to figure that out. Uh, but those things will happen. I, I just and think there needs to be strong language in the beginning to deter that from happening because that we don't want it to be lax where some people might start to take advantage of that. Right. And, and then it incurs, a, it's going to be a domino effect for the whole day now. Now the whole bus is going to be late or two buses are going to be late because you're trying to jockey to get a, guy, a bus that's light to go come and get some. Correct. And, and one of the things that, um, one of the reasons why we felt that phasing in makes sense is because remember that on eight, the first two weeks when we start to bring students in, we're only really bringing in technically 25% of our students. That gives us a really good indication in those first two weeks because we have flexibility. If Johnny, who's supposed to be on B days but shows up on A days, then, then we know, hey, we have a problem here because this child is putting on, being put on the bus on the wrong day and, and maybe have but some movement. That, that's a problem in itself because the child's not even supposed to be in school that day. I'm just talking about a regular A day kid who gets dropped off every day on A day, but mommy doesn't feel like getting up. And she just says, oh, the bus is down a block. Just go with the other A kids. That, that's all I'm saying. Like the Got bus it. stops are bus stops. Like if he's saying, if someone already said, "I'm going to drive," no, the, the, but it, oh, it, I see what you're he's saying. He's a regular a day kid. It's a day. Morning. Morning. Got it. He'll go. What are they going to do? He walks down to the bus stop because the bus usually picks up at the second house. We are going to do a lot of um, instructing and and a lot of presentations to families, and, and this is live, so this is important for me to say. 
We're not going to be able to do this well if we don't have community support. We need people to make sure that they do the assessment at home of their child, so it means that you may have to, you, you may need to take your child's you will need to take your child's temperature and answer the five questions that you need to have so that your child can come to school. This is important for your child, but it's important for all the other children that we have in the district. You also have to make sure that if your child has a fever, you keep them home. I cannot impress that enough. We are in the middle of a pandemic and we need everyone to understand that these things are important. The third thing is that they should always have a mask on. Right? Students need to make sure that they wear a mask when they get on that bus. We're going to have the windows open on the bus, but still, we need to make sure that students wear their mask. And lastly, it's washing your hands. I mean, these are basic things, but it's really important for us to remind people that those are the things that you need to do. Follow the rules, make sure that your child is well, if they have a temperature, please do not send them to school. And the same thing goes for staff and faculty in the district. If you are not feeling well and you have a fever, then you do not come to work, right? Because coming to work could affect other people. So it's really important for the community to understand if everybody isn't in this together, this will not work. And the minute that we start to get large number of students and staff having being COVID pos uh, positive, schools will be shut down. I just want to make sure that people understand that. Because what's going to happen is then we have to shut school down for two weeks and we're going to start all over again. So it's really important that, that we all work together on this and we will do more presentations to explain all these pieces. There's going to be parent training to make sure that parents understand what their responsibilities are. When we talk about online teaching, um, the school district is committed to doing something called uh, Parent University. It's not the name that we're using, but I'm calling it that for right now. Um, Bargov, did you want to speak about that? So it's, it's uh, the, the, the acronym we'll be using, par, uh, Families in, in Technology Training, so FITT. Um, FIT. Some more information will be going out uh, from Mrs. Rodriguez in the next couple of days. The purpose of doing this is we want to be a partner in this process with our parents and students for that reason. Um, there are a lot of investment and significant improvement has been done in technology, and technology is going to play a vital role in this process. So we want our parents to be informed how they can actually check the Google Classroom, how can they help their, their students to make sure that they're following the Google cal Calendar. So working with Dr. Morales and, and ENL teachers, teachers along with the technology coaches, we have come up with a schedule, and basically the last two weeks of the August, we are planning to offer in English and Spanish some hands-on experience, uh, some online training sessions to our parents. So the first step is we will be publishing some videos in the next week or so, and then we will be offering parents the similar setup that we will be showing in the video. We will also be working with the parents to showing them where to find some information on our website, because at some point the website will be inundated with a lot of information. We will also be working with parents on how to use the parent portal, where to go to check their students' grade as well. We will be also bringing in, in this conversation our students too. So this is an attempt to make sure we actually work with our parents and students closely and be ready come September. Thank you, Bargoff. I, I want to throw it back to Dr. Hassa for one quick question, or maybe Mr. <laughs> Rodriguez. So uh, you keep talking about parents letting you know by August 12th whether they're going to select the hybrid or the remote, whether the transportation piece. In the email that was sent last week, the, it says if you are choosing the remote, you will let your building principal know. So is that the anomaly? Is that what's happening? Like you're just assuming that everybody's hybrid unless a notice sent to the principal? Correct. Yes. So it's not going to be a survey to say, do you want to be hybrid or remote? No. 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 Okay. The, 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 We're assuming everybody is hybrid. Right. And unless you say that you're not. Right. And, so and, and in the end. 12th too, to the principal by the 12th. Yes. Yes. Yep. So I have a question about the masks. You mentioned that when a student comes to the bus, they should have a mask. If they don't have a mask on, are we having little masks for them? Yes. Okay. So that's one. You mentioned the windows would be open in a bus. So at 90 degrees, sitting on a bus with a mask on, or even like we're here in air conditioning, my breathing is compromised, I'm asthmatic. A classroom, a school that doesn't have any air conditioning, this is going to be tough. 
So what is the plan on that? I know I sent out an email. Someone wrote fan back to me. Um, so I said, OK, a couple of fans. I guess one intake, one ex, you know, circulating, and one cooling people off. So what's that going to look like? That's, and then are we putting antiseptic or any kind of stations in front of each classroom that everyone goes into? Yeah, and, and how's and, all that working yes, out? Yes, and so let me go back to the original question when a classroom is 90 degrees, right? Normally we would have the windows open. We, um, one of the things about having this phased in approach is that we're really going to be going towards the end of September. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have hot, hot days, mm -hmm. but if we do have a hot day, then that's something that we'll have to address. Uh, teachers have the ability to request what we call a 504 accommodation. So you mentioned that you have asthma. Mm -hmm. If a teacher has asthma and they need a 504, they need an air conditioning, then they go through a process called a 504, and an air condition is put in their classrooms. Um, so those are the things. And again, we're going to have really, really small groups of students. Remember that one of the buildings is the middle school where they have approximately 1,600 students. So you'll have 25% of those students. That doesn't mean that the, the, the heat isn't going to be an issue, but we are looking at ways to mitigate that by having small populations of students. And if needed, then we put an air conditioner. Here's the problem when we talk about the middle school. They do not have the ability to put an air conditioner in every room, even if we could do that because our, our, our power isn't, can't sustain that. So we would have to look at moving students, if possible. If it got, was so hot, then we would close school and we would do a remote day. I mean, that's probably one of the, the, the benefits of having an online robust program that you can shift or pivot to that very quickly. So if that were the situation where it wasn't healthy for our students and our staff to be in the building, then we would say um, today is going to be an online day. The classrooms are just too hot. And then you asked a question about sanitizing, and, and Patrick was going to ask how do we clean buildings, was going to answer that question rather. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to actually read some of this. Um, we, uh, we had a meeting this morning where a lot of the de some of the details about specifically what we're going to do were sort of hammered out. And, and one of the things I just wanted to mention was um, it was something out of the American uh, Society of Pediatrics. Like, and they recommend flexibility, nimbleness in responding to new information. And that's exactly what you know, we were talking about this morning, that we're going to need to be able to pivot, to use the word that we've been using a lot, and refine some of our practices. Um, you know, based on what's working and what's not working. But, you know, just in terms of the school buildings, um, you know, we're going to institute regular cleaning and disinfection of the facilities, um, including more frequent cleaning and disinfection of high risk and frequently touched surfaces. So I have some examples of different areas of the building or different facility types. So bathrooms will be cleaned and disinfected at regular intervals throughout the school day and as needed. Um, we had a goal of two to three times daily. Uh, high touch surfaces such as doorknobs, sinks, and faucet handles will be the primary focus during daytime cleaning and disinfection routines. Athletic training rooms and locker rooms, so similar protocols uh, to the bathrooms would be applicable to locker rooms and training rooms, presuming they're actually even in use. Um, specific weight room cleaning protocols would be evaluated and determined uh, in accordance with public health guidance when these types of facilities are deemed um, safe to operate. Health offices and isolation rooms, so this is the nurse's office, we would again uh, institute our routine daily cleaning protocol. So every night, you know, school buildings are cleaned and there's a whole, you know, routine that's gone through with the cleaning process, so that's not changing. Um, but daily disinfection of surfaces and high touch areas and objects would occur. Isolation rooms, so this would be the, the sick child areas uh, in the nurse's office, uh, would be disinfected and sanitized after every use. So in other words, if there is a sick child who's brought to that area, um, we would uh, contact the custodian after the child's parents pick them up or they leave the area and uh, we, would, we would notify them of the need to sanitize that area before the next sick child could be could be brought in, so that would be something that would be occurring, potentially you know throughout the day, hopefully not. Um, 
Administrative offices, routine daily cleaning protocols would take place with daily disinfection of surfaces using uh, equipment. We have electrostatic sprayers, so we've, we've purchased a lot of equipment, as you referenced, was, was that one of Was that just used when, we, when the, um, they were yes. going in between? Was that yeah. one of those, yep. um, what do you call them? What, electrostatic sprayer. Correct. That was an example yep. of one. Yep. Okay. And, and um, so we've, like I said, we've, we've bought a sufficient number of those in every building to, to be able to do that nightly, actually. So <clears throat> certain high traffic areas may require more frequent cleaning and disinfecting, especially reception areas. So this, this would be like the main office, other areas that may have students coming and going and, and, and staff coming and going. Um, frequently touched surfaces in common areas. So this would be door handles, elevator buttons, that kind of thing copiers potentially. Uh, these surfaces would be wiped down multiple times per day with disinfecting wipes or sprays, uh, depending on the frequency of use. Every effort will be made to uh, do this cleaning when children are not in the area. So this is one of the takeaways of the guidance and takeaways of our sub health, and health and safety subcommittee. Um, if this is not possible, in other words, it's not possible to use the, the cleaning solution when children aren't in the area, um, adequate ventilation should be provided during that. Break rooms uh, for staff. Routine daily cleaning protocols will take place with daily disinfection of surfaces, again, using the electrostatic sprayers at night. Cafeterias and kitchen. Um, we would, again, use our ordinary cleaning protocols. We would wipe down and sanitize tables between each lunch session, which is something that's routinely done um, with nightly disinfection of surfaces using the sprayers. Um, there will be a sort of a, a different protocol within the kitchens themselves. I mean, they're obviously handling food, so they're accustomed to this kind of, you know, sanitizing surfaces and being very careful about handling food. But what we would do in terms of something different or additional would be um, enhanced sanitizing, uh, wipe down of handles, high touch surfaces, objects may occur. We would be installing plastic barriers. Uh, between each cash register to reduce the potential of virus transmission between students and our staff. And um, last but not least, classrooms and labs. We were going to have the routine daily cleaning protocols um, with cleaning and disinfection of desks and other hard surfaces occurring nightly using disinfecting sprayers and or cleaning and disinfecting wipes as needed. So again, we're going to really obviously amp this up and we've invested in equipment and we're committed to investing in additional manpower and you know overtime for staff if needed to to make sure everything's safe and sanitized thank you patrick can i just ask a question about i know one of the pieces of equipment that we've discussed um even if, upon visiting like when they're picking up Chromebooks, et cetera, that one of the things that has been ordered but has yet to arrive are some of the um, hand sanitizer stations. Right. So those have been purchased, correct? That yes. will be placed throughout the buildings in, in high traffic areas that the, that the students, faculty, staff will have access to. Yes, thank you for bringing that up, Stacey, because I, I, I meant to mention that. Lorraine, you brought that <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah, I was so. going to say, you said all this stuff, and I'm like, <laughs> what happened to the stations? Well, I mean, there's actually a lot. There's other facilities, categories. You know, there's, there's air circulation. There's a lot of things that, that sort of fall in that category. But we're addressing sort of the cleaning component tonight. But we are going to be, we've purchased, we're installing. Uh, you know, hand sanit so hand hygiene is important, right? We know that that's one of the, the three legs of the stool, hygiene, distancing, et cetera. So, um, you know, we're gonna, number one, encourage kids to, to wash their hands. We're going to do away with, um, with dryer hand dryers because that's a recommendation. We're gonna use paper, paper towels to dry their hands. That's number one. When you can't wash your hands, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna do more hand washing. And there's certain times they recommend it, you know, before meals, after recess, if they come into the building. But when it's not practicable to do that, we're going to fall back on the hand sanitizer. We're going to have that at the entrances to each building. We're going to have the wall-mounted units, which, you know, again, you sort of you, you pull it. Unfortunately, it can't all be motion activated. Uh, we're going to have those in the... Um, at the entrances to cafeterias, sort of major areas like that. They're going to be the wall-mounted units. We've also ordered hundreds, you know, like 600 um, 
portable. It's just a, like a, literally like a pump bottle that we're going to install in every classroom. So again, it's going to be one of those things where if you can't wash your hands, the fallback is to use the hand sanitizer. We're going to be recommending it be 60% or more alcohol based, which is, you know, what CDC and everybody is recommending, uh, you know, for this situation. So there's going to be plenty of opportunities, you know, to, to clean your hands and, and sanitize your hands. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Any other questions for him? No. Um, how, how are you navigating the whole lunch situation? Some students will eat in the cafeteria. We, are, we have limited space. Some students will eat in a classroom. Mm. It depends upon the size of the class and the number of the students and the, and the period. So we're looking to um, have students eat in the cafeteria. Of course, it has to be six feet social distance. And, um, but yes, we are Because they're going to have to take the mask off. Yes, they have to take. One of the things that they do talk about in the regulation when we talk about masks is that students are going to be, we're, 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 we should provide students with mask breaks, right? So the hope is if the weather is good, we take the students outside. Again, being socially distanced, allow them to take a, a, some fresh air. Uh, and then bring them, you know, obviously come back into school. But yeah, that is part of one of the protocols that we're going to be looking at is when can we give kids, students, mass breaks and adults as well. Um, so yes, we are using the cafeterias to answer your original question. And there's all plasticware, everything. Is that how we yes. usually serve everything mm -hmm. now? Is with everything yeah. is plastic and Feel bad for paper the cups, paper yes. plates? It's yes. always like that? Okay. Yes, we've yes. gone back to we've paper towels and plastic for everything. Correct. Okay. Yes. Plastic. We are looking though at serving hot meals as, as yeah the hot meals as is as that much as we on can. You know some places are just bagged, but uh, you know we know for a lot of our kids that this might be one of the, their only hot meal for the day. So you know, as a district, you. we're trying to make sure that yes. we can do that. And and there are a number of reasons why we're using the cafeteria. Food service is one of them. Obviously, if if we isolate kids exclusively to classrooms, the scope of what we can offer to kids that can be delivered to the classroom is very different than the opportunities if they were physically in the cafeteria. And it goes back to trying to create as normal a day as possible, even going to the cafe. It won't look the same. And I thought I had some pictures. I don't know if Carol is here, but we were trying to, I wanted to share some pictures of the classrooms <clears throat> because we've started to set up our classrooms and what they look like. So if I if we get them maybe... We had an issue because of power. We weren't able to upload them. But yeah, we, we, we're starting to develop pictures, what a classroom would look like, what a cafeteria would look like. It's, it's very different what this board looks like. This is, this is not what we normally do. So can I, I ask that if you're not able to get those up tonight, perhaps you can put those in with your stuff for next week by yes. August 11th? Yes, okay. you got it. So my last question is August 12th, and now we're going to allow families time to plan child care, working situations. When do we anticipate letting families know whether their child is an A or a B or A1, um, A2, B1, B2? You got that? I, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, as of right now, the plan is we won't know definitively until all of the schedules are finished because some of the scheduling is going to be also done because, remember, we also need to not only balance for class size, we need to balance the A and the B groups. So some of the movement of the kids that are going remote only, maybe you have more B kids than A kids that opt for remote only. So we're also going to have to be balancing, on top of just the overall class size, the number of A and B kids. Because if you have a class of 24 kids, you can't have you know, 17 that are A and 7 that are B. So Appreciating all that, it's going to be difficult for parents possibly to, to plan make decisions. Yep. Based on, because they might say, oh, well, you know, my neighbor's an A and we can drive, you know. Correct. So that Correct. would be possible because we have to wait until scheduling is complete, which is likely August. August. So I'm, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the calendar right now as you speak. And I think that the week of August 17th, maybe midweek by August 19th, we will be able to tell families what they're, they're in A or B. And of course, there's always a juggling of that. I'm in, I'm an A, but I ride with, um, Dawn, and so can I please, you know, be with her? And of course, there'll be some 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 reshuffling of students. But our goal is to be able to do it the week of August 17th. Again, we're, we're all going to be working to make sure that we have some some clarity. But but that's our goal. Our goal is August the week of August 17th. I'd like to be able to tell, let our families know what group they're in. And that's also part of the logistics of, I mean, amongst the various other benefits that Mrs. Rodriguez mentioned, 
having the four superintendent conference days before Labor Day and having the two weeks worth of remote learning Helps. also gives them a little bit more leeway to be able to, uh, you know, they're going to have to find child care for the full two weeks of remote learning and then moving forward, it'll give them a little bit of wiggle room to work out some of those logistics as well. Right. I just think they were looking to kind of use that as information in determining whether they were going to choose the remote or the right. hybrid, oh, okay. but understanding that it's because of scheduling issues and balancing right. and right. So, so one of the things that our office did is we reached out to the YMCA and had a conversation with Ross Maselli, who runs the YMCA, our local YMCA. And, and so we have a planned meeting with him because one of the things I'd like to work with him is, is, is hopefully he can open up some sort of child care. Which is, which is difficult. So we're looking for ways to assist our families in the community. The only issue that we're running into um, is that it's very difficult to open up childcare. Like, um, I, don't, I don't know if anybody has their children that go to Little Pals, but I spoke with Angela Nardo recently who said, you know, they waived some of the, the things that we were required to do when we had COVID, but they're not waiving any of that. So I still have a limited number of children that I can you know, take care of. And so one of the things that we're doing is that we're allowing students to now switch schools. So if you go to Little Pals and your Little Pals is your sitter, then you're supposed to go to Smith Clove. Instead, we're going to go to call Sapphire. And we've done that with a couple of parents. Again, there's a lot of juggling that's going on. Um, and, we and just to clarify on your point, the, the communication that you have with the Y is about daily child care, which is different than the Y offering club kid after school, which Correct. is something that we're still looking we're to still offer. We're still working on the club kid right. piece as well, because some parents use that as an opportunity to drop their children off when they're going to work, and the, the children stay late as well. Right. So it's in addition to that, we're looking for some child care. Um, I know that I've been reached out. Uh, I was contacted for Sacred Heart because they have a building that's empty and would we be willing to rent it. The problem for us is not just the space, but we would then have to hire double the amount of teachers and we just can't afford to do that right now. So, so we're looking at all options. I think everybody is, is in the same situation, um, but we'll get through this. Aren't we also going by alphabetical order or no? Like A to L students. So it, it's M it's it's not A through L. It's it's based upon it's based upon the the home address and the household rather than actual name because mm -hmm. you know there are so many different family dynamics where being reliant on every single student in the household having the same name doesn't necessarily get you every student in that house. Gotcha. So we went by household. So when Matt said he hmm. took, you know, this half 32.50 A through, so explain how that came, how was that part of the? It, it was, it was alpha, they did it well, I mean, you can, you can speak to that. No, you're good. No, you're doing a great job. <laughs> I, I didn't even do it. I just gave it to, to Don <laughs> Russell. Hey, can you, can you separate these kids in half? And, and it was like a magic show where they just so there's no uh, way a parent trying to say okay well i i'm my last name is aaron's and your last name is abel no. so we're gonna no. be no okay no, so they done. shouldn't try to figure out right <laughs> no. i know i, I it's, think it's, it's funny think parents are trying to figure out how this is this was an interesting way of doing things we we have certainly learned that you can do things differently during this time um hmm. so i'm going to move on to the last question <laughs> are you yes <laughs> <laughs> Sure, I mean, you I can, want to buy Let me take it. I'll take it. Um, or you want to take it? I'll take it. We'll, ta we'll both take we'll it. We'll take so, it. So here's a question that we ask. What happens if a student or teacher tests positive for COVID-19? Will school close? So I called um, Dr. Gelman, who is the Orange County Commissioner, and I asked that question. And I said, if I have a high school student who uh, has a fever, I send him home. Two days later, the parent calls and says the student is positive for COVID, do I close school? Her answer to me was no. Um, and that is because there's protocols that are in place. You clean the classroom, you, um, uh, you, you find out who the student was in contact with. Mind you, I just want you to know that I will not know the name of the child who tested positive. The nurse will, right? And then they will have a conversation so that then they can do contract tracing, contact tracing to find out who the student came in contact with. We will close school, and this I'm, I'm quoting her, um, when there is a 9% infection rate in the region. 
In the region, not in the yes. school. Right. In the region. Hmm. Now, that is what she said. That can possibly change. Again, school districts, if, if there gets to a point where there's, in my opinion, too many students that are COVID positive, can I close school? Absolutely, because where would I go back to? Remote learning. So I wouldn't be closing school and not having school. But I just want everyone to understand that as it stood a week and a half ago, that was her response. So much so that I actually asked Mr. Kravitz to come and listen to this meeting, because we were having a Google meeting, because I wanted to make sure that I had heard it correctly. And I did, and she explained, you, you just don't close school because one person is positive. You, you, there has to be multiple. And, and so I want to just jump into the question that Kim asked earlier, which is, so are schools going to be tested? So if you read the DOH uh, regulations, school districts are not allowed to test students. What we can do is if we feel that there is an outbreak and um, we have multiple students, we would call Orange County and we would say, look, we think at this point you need to test the students. School districts are not prepared to test children to, to know if they are positive or, or negative. So I just want people to be clear. I, I understand that, that the test is one of the indicators, but one of the things that has been very um, striking for me is that you can test negative mm -hmm. and you can become sick the next day. So, so school districts will not be taking on the responsibilities of testing thousands of students and thousands of staff. From Monroe Woodbury, it would be about 10,000 people. And you the temperature can be taken. Yes. You, you said that's 9% of the county. Of the so region. like, I mean, if one small school somewhere has an outbreak and they have 11% of their population, it's not that the right there makes the whole county shut down. Off shut down. Or is, or is it no, it's the county, that's, the the region. that number is kind of skewed because Correct. you could have a small outbreak in a small school that doesn't affect anybody. But they are, they're the working within regions, right? We're, we're matched up with, we're part of Rockland County. When they look at us, we're part of Rockland County. So that's that the region worse. that they're looking at. And so when they look at the region, it's possible that we will have, you know, that there is a 9% infection rate. Um, New York City came out with theirs, and they said 3% infection rate. So again, this is all subject to change. But I just want to share with you and the community that that's what I was told. And I, I, we are going to be required to work in tandem with Orange, the Orange County Commissioner of Health. And also one of the requirements that school districts will need to know is we constantly need to know how many beds are available. That's something that we'll constantly, Dr. Sassy, who is on our staff, will be making sure that she knows what's the availability of beds in case there's an outbreak. So all of that is another piece that we have to, to take care of. Quarantining is a possibility, though. The school, the, the school may not close. That's that's another layer of this. That the another important factor in designing both the hybrid and the remote model is that while that one case may not necessarily warrant a school closing down, there's a possibility that a class or a group of students may have to quarantine. So there are instances where the whole school may not be shut down, but you may have a class that has to quarantine for two weeks and they, you know, you use the word pivoting, they may have to pivot into an online, you know, remote only model exclusively as a class because of a particular case. So the school Correct. is not shutting down. I mean, we're still in school, just in a remote. Correct. Right. And that's why I go back to the fact that the first two weeks of school remote is going to be um, important for the school district, for the teachers, for the students, for the families, because there is going to be times when we will have to pivot very quickly to online. Um, and then go back. So th there may be a back and forth. I, I use the word imperfect to describe this year because I think we all have to understand that going into this year, there are a lot of things that are unknown. What about the time of the, d the school day? Is that being looked at at all? Yes. We are looking at when students are remote versus when students are in the building. We are we're looking at the time. So it because could there's potentially flexibility. change, right? If you're yes. a high school student and your day is 7 to 2, now it may be 9 to 4 or something like that? If you're remote, correct. Right. If you're if remote. You're remote. Okay. But we're still going to stagger. Remember that we have to, um, we're a three-tier system, so we bring in students, you know, elementary, middle school, and high school at three different times. We're going to continue that. So th those times are going to be the same. Just correct. Just the population. The regular school day is still the same. Correct. Remote might be different. So yes. Just everyone. Correct. Yes. And what about sports? If, if there's sports and, and students are home, they have the 
ability to come back and participate in that sport? Yes. Um, I don't. Remote. Sports, sports right now, sports right now are postponed, and I think that they're waiting to see what happens. I think that there's going to be a if if we're still in a place where we have to have a hybrid model because of the amount of CDC. And, and Department of Health guidelines, I think it may be challenging for them to be able to run sports. So I think, you know, that's something that remains to be seen, I think. But if you're a remote learning person, you're remote learning, you're not considered a home student. No, you're, no, a different you're our student. No. So, so just one of the reasons... The rules are different. Correct. One, one of the reasons why we, we ended up offering that option for parents is because if you were a parent and you were adamant about not sending your child physically in school, the only option would be to withdraw your child from the school district and homeschool your child. By giving this opportunity, it still maintains kids enrolled in the school district, placed in a class, receiving instruction from our teachers. So that's, that's another factor for us offering it. Another question that came up and I should share with, with everyone was, if I was not allowed to come to school because my children were not vaccinated, could I now send, enroll my child and have them do online remote, fully online? And the answer to that question is no. And the reason it's no is because that is a law. Mm -hmm. So the law requires anyone that's going to sign up or, or register in a school district in order to take access to the school to be vaccinated. So that has not changed. Um, Even though it's remote? Correct. correct. Because you still, in order to it's register your children, you have to show that you have vaccinated your children. Because remember, the other piece that we have to we have to remember is that this is this is we're looking at things that from a two month perspective, right? Every two months, we're going to look at how we're doing, and we don't know what the year will look like. We may eventually, you know, if if Turn I fully. had my my hope that we come back and we're traditional, that there is some you know, something that, that allows us to do traditional school. I don't know that. So we have to maintain, and again, it's, it's not Monroe Woodbury's decision, it's the law. Mm -hmm. So when the law was enacted to say that students needed to be vaccinated in order to be school, in order to be in school, that has not changed. So you don't have the option to fully, to go f to remote school. I just wanted to share that because that was a question that I had. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna have a lot more questions that we're gonna yes. put up. And those will be for delivery for next week? Yes. Either ends on the website, via email, et cetera? Yes. Okay. And then I put, we put this picture. Actually, Carol Spenley put this picture up. Because to me, it represents that our children are probably the most resilient group of people. And we want to make sure that we create as normal a year as possible with all the things that students normally have. And the line at the bottom is everything will be okay. It will be. It's, it's, it's going to be different. It's going to be imperfect. It's going to be hard. But we're going to be okay. So with that, I thank the board and the, everybody in the audience for listening. And if they have any more questions, you can go on our website and ask us more questions if, if you so choose to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, Donna, do I need to get a motion to accept that? No. Okay. Just a presentation. Um, so can I please get a motion to accept the new revised 2020-2021 student calendar, which will reference the dates that Mrs. Rodriguez mentioned um, for the superintendent conference days and the start of remote learning for September 8th. Motion. motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Can I please get a motion for the approval of the 2020 Board of Education Manual? Motion. motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And approval of the minutes? Motion. Motion. Second? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, Chris, can we just go over the first reading of the policy manual update? This is for the updates for policies number 7240 for student records and number 8470 for home instruction. Do you just want to, I know you just mentioned the home instruction piece. Yeah, the student records, we just kind of uh, tweaked a little bit. There was some uh, legislation that came out. We just added something, we changed some wording around just to uh, make it clear of who is allowed to obtain student records and who is not. Uh, and the uh, 8470, the home instruction, we thought we needed to get 
uh, nailed down and put together with this pandemic that some students might think they are able to remote learn and not and homeschool, that there actually is a difference. And we just cleaned up the language and we added a few uh, things in there concerning uh, textbooks and availability of things that are required to students and things that they're not allowed to do. Uh, and we also are going to ask to waive the second reading of this. I'm just moving ahead uh, because we want to get that home instruction one put in the calendar now before we do anything further. So. Okay, thank you. So can I please get a motion for the first reading of the policy motion. manual update? Second. All those in favor? Aye. And a motion for the waiving of the second reading? Motion. All second. those in favor? Second. Second. Aye. I'm sorry, second. <laughs> um, I missed the policy meeting. Can you send me the minutes? Yes. Yes, do we have them? She's, yes. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, committee reports. Reports by Board of Education committees. Um, I know Chris just spoke about policy. Um, Dawn, do you want to do um, visitation? So visitation, uh, we are trying to coordinate some dates uh, to finish up for the, this school year, and then we will jump right into 2021 and start over, and we might do a few revisits on some of the schools to see where we're at with some of the action items that we left off with. And the Orange County School Board Association has not had a meeting again since we last met. Thank you. Don, facilities? Um, I don't know if, if Patrick has any updates on the... Uh track and the yeah just a couple of minor things um, I had spoke about the paving that we were intending to do uh, around the roadway uh, around the, the bleachers and the football field so that's completed what we what we ended up doing is uh, having the roadway go up to the high school where the where there was a roadway and the new paving meets that and we also changed a little bit where we actually paved the roadway up to the back of the middle school so it'll be safer uh, it was pretty broken up, uh, particularly the roadway up to the middle school. It'll be a little cleaner, a little less dusty, uh, easier access to the fields uh, for everybody, frankly. And um, we, we did a little rep uh, repair paving at the middle school. There were some areas broken up, so we took care of that. And, um, you know, we, we're working on the ramp, connector ramp between the two fields, and we had a little drainage issue, but we're, so that's delayed that a little bit, but um, we're going to wrap that up pretty quick, too. But that's, that's about it. And we've scheduled an audit meeting, so that... That's was it. there any uh, future about the actionable items from last time that we sent, land sent to them? Was everything okay? Did yeah. Did they uh, come back with any... Uh, applied has been in district. I, I, I would have to actually check uh, with Peter on what still needs to be taken care of. And, and one of the issues <clears throat> with the connector ramp, um, the drainage issue that I mentioned, has to do with an issue that involves... Uh, applied landscape technology so it's sort of another change item that it's it's not big money that that we're what negotiating about the request money. for uh, a extension on the warranty on a bunch of things only because of the unused yep. action, that we haven't used it so i would i would have to follow up with uh with James. I would, that was just one of the questions i had asked if we could yep you know, i'll follow up warranty on just because we may not find something wrong with something yeah and that's a good a All good right. point i just have a question i I know that the track is open and I took a nice little walk and there were a couple of people that were running on the track. Um, what time are you allowed to be on the property because it was very, very dark and I don't know, do we put lights on and then shut them off at a certain time, but it was, you know, you mentioned something about being safe and part of that is having lights and nobody kind of creeping somewhere. Well, hmm. we, we don't actually light the, um, the, the track. track for track use. We, we allow people to use the track and, you know, we, we try to limit and we do limit field use. In fact, we're, we have a security guard who has been this summer um, sort of designated to, you know, patrol the fields, the entire district, et cetera. Um, the, the only lights that we allow people to turn on are the tennis court lights. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in terms of, of times, I, I, I think it's probably around 9 p.m. You know, the, the facilities would be officially closed, 8 maybe, perhaps, uh, where you'd want people off. Um, but, the, but there's nothing specific, Lorraine, about, um, you know, if they're down there. And it's, I, I think our patrol, our campus patrols are, I think our campus patrols are running um, around 8 p.m., something like that, 8, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., so, um, 
you know, if after that, if they're down there, um, you know, well, other than wa walking on that track, you're technically not supposed to be out there unless you have filed the paperwork with the sports That's department right. and you've filled out application and you have approval. So technically, so you're not you, after, actually allowed after after hours, you sh you shouldn't be out there anyway. You, you, so I shouldn't have been I, out I mean, there. No, I'm saying <laughs> you're walking around the track at 10 o'clock. You shouldn't be there. In no, the first it wasn't place. 10. Right. Uh, if a sports team wants to use the thing, they still have to get an application to use the the, the facility. Same thing if, I mean, you know, if you want to do something on the track other than you just stroll around, you really shouldn't be on there. Uh, uh, maybe in the daytime, we're being a little lax. I don't know. I, I, mean, I think, I think we're allowing Rory. some individual track use like we, right. we always have, you know. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But I'm just saying. Yeah, there were no kids. It was adults, actually. Mm -hmm. There was probably about 10 adults. And limited within sunrise to sunset. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it was dark, and I was like, it's time to leave. It just... Well, then security probably yeah. should do a final... I didn't walk see anybody, dark, that's all. Just to make I sure nobody just... is out there in case of just for safety issues. Yeah. But the, the community should know that after dark, if the lights are off, the facility is officially closed. But there was no lights on at all. That's my point. There's none at all. It's time for night-night. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and I just want to repeat in case nobody heard what Don had said, um, but the audit committee is scheduled to meet this Tuesday morning, I believe, coming up this week. Correct. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, reports by uh, our uh, student representative, Emily. Um, so I talked to a lot of students about like the what they had to think about the reopening with schools, and their main concern was the extracurriculars that are surrounding um, their like schoolwork, I think that's the main part of what makes school so special. You know, they like they could easily learn just based on like knowledge and stuff like that. But I think extracurriculars really like make up the school and the experience. And they're really concerned about you know the electives. I know my friends that are art majors are really concerned about how they're gonna get those up and running. A lot of um, concerns about the music department and also about school trips that are in the future. Um, students are also really concerned about that. So that's about it right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for personnel, Matt, but before we get to the entire piece for personnel, um, we're going, can I please get a motion to table 15.8, which is the department chairpersons for 2020, 2021. We're looking to have a little bit of a presentation on that at our next meeting for August 19th. So we're just going to pull that one piece out for this evening. Can I have a motion for that? Motion. Motion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so for the rest of personnel, Matt. So for the rest of personnel, I, I respectfully request uh, approval for the items that are listed under personnel. Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. <clears throat> And then for business and financial for Patrick, for the um, contracts that we have? Yeah, so um, I would also respectfully request approval of the items under the business financial section, which includes six contracts for professional services. Uh, there's a, uh, two awards. There are actually renewals of existing um, contracts for um, overhead door maintenance and kitchen uh, equipment repairs, and finally, uh, obsolete uh, surplus vehicles, I think there's eight vehicles, seven buses and one truck with mileage about 110 to 152,000. So they're just no longer worth the investment. We're gonna surplus those. That's it. Any questions or discussion? Okay, can I have a motion? Motion. 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 Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, committees on special education and preschool special education? Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Report, excuse me, reports by the board and central office. <laughs> Who's going to go first? I feel like we're in such a different layout this time. So I'm, I'm going to, I don't want to forget anybody this time. So I'm going to start with Donna. <laughs> I don't have a microphone, but. Um, you better say something good now. You got up. <laughs> I have great Not just news. Good night. <laughs> have great so news? I was informed. I got a, emails and text messages while Mrs. Rodriguez was doing her presentation, and I have been informed that if you weren't able to hear her, 
um, the video with a good audio will be um, on our website tomorrow. So first thing in the, not first thing in the morning, but in the morning. So I know a lot of people were concerned about that. So if you're still watching, don't fret. And other than that, um, that's really it. Thank you. Thank you. Emily? Um, I don't really have anything at the moment. <laughs> thank you. Chris? Uh, I just want to say thank you to Elsie and the cabinet and Dawn and the board members that are on this task force. I know it hasn't been easy. Uh, our governor doesn't make anything easy, and he could come out next week and it, we could be throwing this all in the garbage for all we know. Hopefully not. So I just, congrats, you know, good luck. Hopefully everything works the way we plan, and hopefully we don't get a, a wrench thrown in anything, and let's look forward to things becoming as normal as possible. That's all. Go on. Okay, so my head is kind of like whew, spinning from all this information, and there's you know uh, there's a lot. Take some time till next meeting, and then <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot going on. But I, I do want to say that like as we were sitting here, I was starting to write down some of the words that like we just keep hearing right uh, for the past four months, like pivot and social distancing and COVID screening and hybrid and synchronous learning and and imperfect and. But one that really stuck out to me was all in this together, which, you know, Mrs. Rodriguez mentioned it a few times. And I just want everyone to know that, and I don't want to speak for the board, but a lot of the questions that I asked tonight were really for my benefit. They're for the community so that you know, you know, what's going on and all the work that's been going on to try to figure out this reopening plan. Um, I just want to take a quick minute to thank um, Christine Ricker, the Director of People Personnel Services, who was my co-chair on the SEL Task Force, which was part of the, uh, the reopening, the core team. Um, we, there was a lot of work that went into that, and I, again, I don't want to speak to all the different uh, committees, but specifically that one, there was Christine and I and 34 people, and those 34 people were parents and students and school psychologists and, and social workers and school counselors and staff and librarians and directors and administrators. So we really had you know, representation of all the stakeholders within our district, and we really looked to do the best that we could do and come up with you know, workable solutions within the guidelines that we were given. So I just hope everyone appreciates that it wasn't just the core team or, or the, it, it was a collaborative effort of everybody coming together with, with shared concerns to come out with the best possible outcome. So, and thank you for your presentation and thank you for the patience of everybody with all the questions that I had. Thank you, Don. So yeah, the, the same with the reopening. Uh, summer for at least board members is us usually not very busy. Um, and the reopening sort of did that. And I'd especially like to thank the technology group because this is the busiest time of the year for them. So the distraction of having to put together the reopening plans on top of all of the, you know, they do all their work while the students are not in school to get ready for next year. So they have a extremely busy scheduled during the summer. So I just want to say thank you to them. But uh, we had a great group, both the public and internal people were extremely helpful. So it went really well. That's it for me. Thank you. Dan? Well, I, I could see by the look on the faces of the audience that they, they missed coming here for the in-person <laughs> meetings. And rather than being at home on their computer, you can't see their faces. they're not wearing them. <laughs> I can <just> feel, <laughs> feel their love. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to say everybody have a good night. The ones Thank at home you. can't see us because they're out of power and yeah, no well. internet. So. That's true. That's true. Michael? I just want to thank Elsie and the Cabinet for all the work on the plan and also the 90 participants that uh, put in for it. Uh, there was a lot of work. Uh, it, you can tell there was a lot of care and concern, uh, a lot of balancing that happened. So I really appreciate that, and I know the parents in the district do as well. And that's all I have. Have a good night. Thank, thank you. you, Lorraine. So yes, I want to thank the cabinet and Elsie. I know this must be really challenging. This whole year has been challenging. So hopefully, you know, it'll just, I, I appreciated what you said when it won't, it won't happen unless everyone, you know, is involved. So, you know, there's going to be some, you know, shortcomings, some full shorts, it's going to happen. So we're here to support. So, uh, you know, just thank you. You definitely, I say extra prayers. <laughs> I need them. We all need them. Yes. Have a good night. Thank you. Patrick? Yeah, so I'll, I'll make it quick. So um, some of you may remember in the past, uh, actually for the past six years, we've leased a vehicle, um, a 2002 uh, small bus, to the Village of Monroe Police Department. So um, the, the vehicle has little or no value for us. And um, what we're going to propose 
um, at the next meeting uh, is leasing, and we, I'm air quoting leasing for a dollar, that's what we do, and we've done for six years, uh, leasing that same vehicle to the town of Blooming Grove because Village of Monroe Police Department no longer needs it. Um, but we, we did receive a nice letter, which I'd like to read from the, the Village of Monroe Police Department for allowing us to, uh, or allowing, uh, f from them for, uh, for us, for allowing them to use one of our vehicles. So it's to uh, Dawn Russell, a director of uh, transportation, and Dawn has been you know, sort of instrumental in facilitating this for six years. So it says, on behalf of the Monroe Police Department, I'd like to express our sincere gratitude for the leasing of the 2002 Ford Utility Bus from the Monroe Woodbury School District over the last six years. We are able to utilize the vehicle for the storage and transportation of traffic control devices. It has been used during major events, crime scenes, parades, festivals, concerts, and school events within the Village of Monroe. Although we will not be renewing the lease, <laughs> um, the Monroe Police Department looks forward to continue our partnership with the Monroe Woodbury Transportation Department. So it's a nice letter. It's a good example of intermunicipal cooperation. And at the next board meeting, as I said, the, uh, the town of Blooming Grove has requested to lease our, our vehicle. You'll, you'll see that on the agenda. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Argoff? So our device distribution process is going very well. As of this afternoon, we have distributed 5,240 devices to our students and families. So we still have about 1,400, 1,500 more to go. But if you have not signed up, I highly encourage parents to sign up in a picket time and then come. We, we have different hours on different days, Monday to Thursday. Um, take the advantage up front so that way at least the, the child will have a device uh, at home um, in the beginning of the remote learning. A couple of years before, um, board approved the Smart School Bond project, and, and, and we are now coming toward the end of that project. We are working on a very small final punchline items, but that allowed us to increase our wireless connectivity tremendously. So every single classroom in our district has a wireless access point uh, that improves the connectivity of all the devices that we are rolling out. We also mounted the access points in a common area like cafeterias and auditoriums. So last year when we had a meeting here, we only had one access point. Today we have four access points here, so two up front, two in the back. Mm -hmm. So we have making this strategic decision increasing the connectivity. We are also planning to increase our internet bandwidth, double our internet bandwidth uh, before the school start. We are also planning to increase our inter uh, the connectivity from us to both is 10 times. So this is all planning phase and then as Mrs. Rodriguez mentioned that the first two weeks will give us a really good test of our internal capacity, but we are preparing ourselves to be in a, in a better shape than what we are today. Thank you. Stacy, am I out of questions? Because I have one for Bargoff. <laughs> I'm sorry, what's that? <laughs> am I out of questions? I have one for Bargoff. <laughs> okay. Um, Something like tonight's YouTube of the Board of Ed presentation, I mean the Board of Ed meeting, is a student at home with their Chromebook able to log on and, and view this? Yes. Okay, so our YouTube, because I know that YouTube is blocked, but our YouTube channel? YouTube is open for our students. Um, okay. And because a lot of, believe it or not, a lot of instructional materials are now on the YouTube, so we do not block the YouTube for our students. We okay. do filter the inappropriate content. Filter, okay. But if the child, if the student log into their district assigned Chromebook, uh, they just need to go to district channel on YouTube and able to watch. Thank you. Thank you. Matt? So, uh, thank you. So I know there, there are still a lot of unanswered questions um, for our students and our staff and our, our, our families, but, um, and that, those unanswered questions can certainly lead to some feelings of uneasiness, um, but I just want to address the staff. So if you are concerned, if you're, you're struggling with all of this, please, please, please reach out to us so that we can um, work with you to, to try and make sure that all this gets settled. So I just want to make sure that I said that to the staff. Secondly, um, congratulations to, to North Maine on their, their recent Most Popular Garden of 2020 award uh, given out by Strauss Dirt Magazine. Uh, when that garden was planted about 11 or 12 years ago, it was, uh, you, you know, done so. <laughs> I'm not going to say who, who did it. Um, beautifully. Beautifully. But it was basically. There you go. Uh, Under your guide. <laughs> it was, it was, when it was, when it was done, the goal was that to was really partner, <laughs> partner with the neighbor. Like, I've, I've got such a like, good, oh. I've got such a good line too. It's, it's, it's so good. Um, no, the, the, the goal of that garden was really to partner with the, the neighbor who is the church in order to really help the whole neighborhood. And, uh, 
congratulations, because it's really, it's, it's much better now than it was back then, and uh, congratulations. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Eric? So thank you to Mrs. McClear for working with me on our, our various subcommittees in the reopening plan. Um, thank you also to the dozens and dozens of uh, community members and staff that participated. We, um, we, we had some heated conversations at times, and, and I think that that was the result of very passionate people who wanted to do the best that we possibly could in putting a lot of these models together. And I think, you know, while it is very challenging, I think at times this is when you really see the best in people who kind of rise to the occasion to, to come up with this. So thank you very much to the committee. You're not off the hook yet because we're still making a lot of decisions and things are being ironed out. So I'm, I'm going to be continuing to, you know, reach out with Mrs. McCleary to, to kind of get people together to talk about this. Summer school graduations next week. Hopefully the board got an invitation to that, so please mark that on your calendars. It's, it's an awesome event. Next week is also the conclusion of our Summer Crusaders program, our extended school year program, so you'll be getting an invitation to that as well. We have some end of the, end of the summer activities planned for that as well. So congratulations to all those students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's been a really, really difficult year, but I have to say one thing about this community and our administrators, our Board of Education, our staff. I would not want to go through what we're going through without this team. This is truly a team effort. Um, from, from, you know, big decisions to little decisions, I cannot tell you how hard everyone has worked. And making sure that front and the most important thing is our students and our staff. Make them safe, make this year as normal as possible. So I cannot thank you enough. Um, those 90 plus people who were part of our task force, some of them were doctors, as I said, or nurses, or um, just parents. And I am so proud of the work that you did. Um, and I cannot thank you enough, but you were instrumental in what we developed today. And again, we continue to listen to our families, be responsive, and do the best job that we can. But you are an awesome team, and for those parents who are watching, you should know that these people here really care about your kids. With that, have a great summer. Have an enjoyable rest of the summer. Thank you. We'll see each other again in two short weeks. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> great two weeks. Um, thank you. I just I took a couple of notes just as uh, Mrs. Rodriguez was giving her presentation and as everybody was kind of speaking. And I mean, it goes without saying, obviously, that the majority of us that are sitting up here are because we're parents. So for those that might not have already known it, I have four children that are sitting in these chairs. Um, one of which has already graduated, but I still have three others. So when Mrs. Rodriguez talks about that 90, almost 100 plus people that were in this task force, it was a collaborative effort. There were heated conversations at times, but when I, I tell you that I can sit here confidently and say that I will make a positive choice for my children that works for my family based off of everything that has been done behind the scenes, that's the message that I want to put out there to everyone. With that said, it is an individual decision. So I am hoping that after tonight's meeting, I encourage you all, thank you Donna for sharing about the audio because I know there was some issues in the beginning. I encourage the community, the parents, the staff, the faculty, go back, watch the video, listen to the questions, listen to the presentation, gather your information. Please read the emails that come out. I understand that it's lengthy. I realize that, like we were saying, that normally the summer is a little bit of a quiet time. We're trying not to inundate with so much information, but at the same time, for somebody like myself, I appreciate the information because it's going to help make the decision for your individual family. And that, I think, is what's critical here. Um, this, the community support, I can't stress enough that we have had tremendous community support with every, everything that we've been talking about and doing. And this, the top priority has been safety and going to what um, Emily discussed is social emotional. And I want to thank Dawn and um, Mrs. Ricker and her entire task force because we were able to pop into all these meetings on Google Chat. So we would pop in and the ideas that came out of that and I don't want to say that I promise, Emily, but again, I have students that are sitting in these seats that say the same thing as you. People are working hard behind the scenes to make extracurricular happen. Um, extracurricular, athletics, 
My daughter asked about the pep rally. It's not going to look the way it has ever looked, but I can tell you that there are people that are working hard to make these happen in some way, shape, or fashion. And I feel confident in that, and I thank them for that, because it's not easy. And there are a lot of negativity and a lot of things that are out there that it's difficult to kind of get through all that. But I encourage you to please take the time to do your research. Please don't compare Monroe Woodbury to your sister's school, your aunt's school, your cousin's school. We all have it. I did it in the spring. I was guilty of it. <laughs> Everybody up here can tell you that they were getting calls from Stacey McCleary. Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing that? My nephew's doing this. My niece is doing that. There's reasons. And after sitting in these meetings with the task force, it's, I know it's difficult for, for everybody to see that, but the questions that you are asking, we are asking. All of us up here, as you saw tonight, those questions that just happened tonight, they're happening tenfold behind the scenes. So for that, I thank Mrs. Rodriguez and her entire cabinet and all of the administrators that are sitting out there because we have not let them rest. And that you can be confident in that the questions that you're asking, the board members are asking, and they are answering it. I ask that you please be patient while we get the information all to you. Hopefully tonight a lot of that was shared. Um, but again, I'm just going to repeat that please gather your information, and if you have more questions, please send them. We are encouraging that it gets posted so that everybody can make the best decision for their family. Yes. And can with say, that, we will see. Can we on say one August more thank 19th. you? <laughs> now I'm like Dawn. I, I do want to thank two people who are the most behind the scenes people, and that's Carol Spenley and Prudis Thurston. They do so much yes. work behind the scenes, and I am so thankful for them where too. So Carol? thank you. Yes, where thank is you. Carol. Carol's literally probably behind the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> where is Prudence? They are also I'm very prudent. responsible for helping us get our message out on social media. I encourage you to not just go to our Facebook page, which has great information, but please visit our district website. Like I know the, the community garden was posted on there. They do a phenomenal job in just trying to share a lot of what's taking place on our district website. I visit it daily. I know that that's probably more than a lot of people, but, but I encourage you to visit the website because there is a lot of information on there that you can resource as well. And I think that's it. My last two announcements are to please remember to social distance as you leave. Please exit to this door over here to my left. We will be back at the high school again on August 19th in the same format. Um, Ms. Vitucci will pr uh, put everything up on the district website, but as I sit here, my guess is it will be the same format that we had tonight with social distancing, um, your COVID screening test, and any questions and or comments can be sent in to the district clerk. Forgetting anything? No. Nope. Okay. Have a great night. Thank you. Motion, well, 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 oh, oh, yes. motion to adjourn. No, no. 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 Motion, motion to going exec. Oh, exec. <laughs> See, I'm still learning. <laughs> motion to adjourn into executive session to discuss um, a matter of FERPA. Motion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>